an inclusive solution for air quality and climate change, a virtual regional learning event for Southeast Asia. I am Dr. Nguyen Thi Kim Wang, professor from the Asian Institute of Technology. I will be your host for this session on tools and data sandbox, experimenting with data-driven decision-making. A few reminders to guide us before we start our session. Please be informed that the session video and own chats will be recorded. Please send in your questions to the chat box. These will be addressed by our speaker in the chat. Please feel free to upload other participants' questions, which you would also like to ask the panelists by clicking the up button directly below the question. To provide an introduction to the session and frame the importance of data in decision and policy making, I would like to call on Dr. Eric Yusman. Eric is senior policy researcher, a research director of global environment studies at Hayama, Japan. Dr. Zuzman holds a bachelor degree in Mandarin Chinese from George University, a dual master degree in public um, policy and Asian studies from University of Texas at Austin, and a PhD in political science from the University of California, Los Angeles. Eric, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kim, and uh, good afternoon, everybody from uh, Hayama, Japan, uh, and I uh, hope everybody is doing well. I'm delighted to be here for this uh, exciting session. I mean, uh, who doesn't like uh, playing in the sandbox, right? Uh, so uh, we look forward to um, this uh, stimulating discussion. And uh, I want to highlight that uh, to begin, our session really has uh, three major objectives. Uh, first, um, we're going to uh, introduce you to a set of decision-making tools that can help estimate uh, co-benefits of different types of integrated solutions. Um, we're going to show you uh, how these decision-making tools uh, can demonstrate these different types of uh, benefits within the context of air quality and climate action. And then uh, perhaps uh, most in importantly, we're going to inspire. Uh, we want you to start thinking about uh, how you can actually apply these tools to your uh, own context uh, so that you can come up with your own integrated solutions to air quality, climate change, and a bunch of other social uh, and uh, development uh, priorities. Um, just as a, a little bit of uh, context setting, I mean, I think it's important to uh, understand that uh, the work that we're doing here has a, a very long history in some ways. I mean, the very first uh, type of uh, evidence-based or um, uh, science-based decision-making um, is probably cost-benefit analysis, which dates all the way back to uh, uh, the 1700s. Um, but we've seen a tremendous uh, increase in the use of uh, different types of uh, science-based decision-making tools, especially since the 1990s. In fact, uh, in preparing for this uh, session, um, what I noticed is uh, if you look at the number of articles that have been published on uh, cost-benefit analysis, which is, uh, uh, I'd say, sort of the, the father or mother, if you will, of, uh, of the types of tools that we're going to see uh, later in the session. There's been uh, over 55,000 uh, uh, articles that have been published on uh, cost-benefit analysis uh, since uh, 1990, over about a 30-year period. Um, so I think uh, you know what we're seeing is a sort of uh, uh, development and evolution of uh, area of study that has a, a long lineage. But and this is perhaps uh, most importantly, I think what we're, we're seeing more and more these days, and uh, our colleagues Chris and Kendra are going to demonstrate this, is that uh, these tools are becoming um, the types of things that are applied more and more, um, and not just by scientists or researchers. I mean, uh, I uh, know Chris uh, Mali very well. I speak to him on a weekly basis, and uh, he's an excellent researcher, but um, he's even better at uh, equipping uh, people um, who are not necessarily researchers with the skills and knowledge to use these tools in 
um, their own decision making processes. And so, for instance, right now, Chris is actively working with colleagues from uh, Thailand's uh, Pollution Control Department um, to help uh, um, develop uh, an action plan on climate change and air pollution. And uh, Kendra, I haven't got a chance to, to meet you personally, um, but uh, I can also see the work that you're doing has uh, tremendous on the ground impacts because uh, it's resonating with the, the, the people that, uh, that the, the livelihoods that are, are being affected by uh, indoor air pollution issues. Um, so I think we're really seeing this type of approach um, meeting stakeholders' needs and, uh, and uh, making connections uh, to reiterate one of the points that was raised in our previous session. This is not only about linking science and policy, but it's about linking science, policy, and um, society. Um, so in the name of uh, strengthening uh, this uh, science, policy, and society interface, uh, I want to now uh, turn it back to um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kim On. Um, and uh, and have her uh, set up uh, the case studies of uh, data driven decision and uh, policy making. So, uh, Dr. Kim, um, the floor is uh, back to you, and uh, I look forward to a stimulating and exciting discussion. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Thank you. So, uh, next, uh, for our first panel, we will be hearing about example of tools that have been used to inform air quality and climate-related plans, policy, and interventions. To start our discussion, I'd like to call on Chris Malley of the Stockholm Environmental Institute. Chris joined Stockholm Environmental Institute in September 2015 as a research associate focusing on the development of the climate and clean air coalition supporting nation planning. We call it CCAC SNAP. Kids. His work involved the formulation of emission inventory, future scenarios, cost benefit analysis, and trainings of the Tunkis to users. So, Chris will share about the application of a tool called the Long Range Energy Alternative Planning System Integrated Benefits Calculator, or it controlled for LIP IBC in reducing short-lived climate pollution in Bangladesh. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here. And it's always a hard job to follow Dr. Eric Zussman, but I will try my best and would like to really emphasize in my presentation the key point that he made about not applying tools just to undertake scientific research, but to provide the evidence for decision-making processes. So I'm sure that a lot of you have heard about the substantial co-benefits that we can achieve for air quality and climate change in an integrated way. I would just add in my favorite demonstration of the magnitude of the co-benefits that can be achieved at a global level. The graph here comes from a study in 2018 by the European Commission Joint Research Center, who looked at how implementing um, countries' climate change commitments that were submitted in 2015, how they could simultaneously reduce air pollutants at the same time as reducing greenhouse gases. And they found that the reduction in air pollutants that were achieved from these climate change plans were enough to avoid 400,000 premature deaths per year by 2050 from the reduced air pollution exposure. So there was a substantial health benefit from countries implementing what they had committed to when the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015. But the more substantial result from this study was that if countries increase their climate change mitigation ambition to be consistent with uh, limiting temperatures to two degrees of warming, never mind 1.5 degrees, the health benefits more than doubled. Instead of 400,000 premature deaths avoided, the health benefits exceeded 1 million premature deaths avoided by 2050 if we achieve the Paris Agreement targets from the air pollution that is reduced alongside greenhouse gases. So suddenly this shows at a global level the substantial health 
benefits that we can achieve from ambitious climate change action. But the key question that Eric alluded to was, how, what does this mean at the national level or for a city in terms of maximizing the health benefits and the air pollution improvements from climate change action at those levels? And it is the LEAP tool, the low emissions analysis platform that tries to provide planners, researchers, decision makers with a tool to be able to answer this question, to be able to say what are the uh, strategies that can be implemented that are specific to my country or my city that can maximize these benefits for air pollution and climate change? What are the key strategies? A leap has been developed over the past 40 years as a scenario uh, planning tool for looking at low emission development. It aims to allow users the ability to look into the future and to assess how emissions of greenhouse gases and key health damaging air pollutants um, are likely to change in response to drivers like population and economic growth, as well as what um, the implementation of different policies and measures designed to reduce these emissions um, could do in terms of, of reducing air pollutants and greenhouse gases. There are over 50,000 LEAP users and it's been extensively used for uh, nationally determined contributions, as well as other climate change uh, reporting. But the application that I want to highlight is in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has been a, a founding member of an organization called the Climate and Clean Air Coalition since 2012. And as part of the national planning initiative of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, resolved in 2018 to develop and publish a national action plan to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. And this national action plan was endorsed by the Ministry of Forests, um, Environment and Climate Change and aimed to identify a set of specific concrete policies and measures that could reduce air pollutants and reduce greenhouse gases at the same time. I want to emphasize here that the work I'm presenting is not um, my work. It was developed by researchers from the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology um, and uh, CEGIS, which is a, a research institute in Bangladesh that supported the Department of Environment in the development of this plan. They gathered the necessary data to be able to estimate emissions of air pollutants and greenhouse gases from all source sectors, to estimate historical emissions, such as shown as on this graph. What this allowed them to do was to identify where is there an overlap between our air pollutant emissions like black carbon and particulate matter and our key greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. And we can see that sectors like transport, um, residential um, uh, fuel consumption, waste sector and agriculture are all major sources of air pollutants and of greenhouse gases. Having identified these major sources, they then identified the key policy interventions that they wanted to assess. And I think the important thing about implying tools like LEAP is that the evaluation of particular policies and measures needs really specific information on what the target and timeline for implementation of particular policies and measures are to be effective in um, evaluating their emission reductions. So we have very specific targets and timelines for the replacement of um, uh, of cook stoves or for the capture of landfill gas in the waste sector or for transitioning to um, um, less polluting vehicles. And what we're then able to see is how the emissions respond to the implementation of all those policies and measures. If we compare the second 
uh, column from the left, which shows the 2030 emissions without the implementation of any policies and measures. And then the final column, which shows how implementing all of these policies and measures could reduce emissions, we're able to see that this package of policy actions would be extremely effective in reducing emissions of black carbon by approximately 50%, as well as greenhouse gases like methane and CO2 by 40% and 30% respectively, compared to the baseline scenario. So we know that these, um, from the analysis that was done in LEAP, that these policies and measures achieve simultaneous reductions in greenhouse gases and in air pollutants. What we're then able to do using LEAP IBC is link these emissions to the output from an atmospheric chemistry transport model and then to a health impact assessment methodology that we may hear more about in the next presentation to say, well, how do these emissions affect the impacts that we care about, the impacts on human health? And what we see here is that the implementation of these policies and measures could avoid 12,000 premature deaths per year from reducing outdoor air pollution exposure and 100,000 premature deaths per year from reducing exposure to household air pollution. So we are targeting both major sources of air pollutant exposure, and this provides key arguments as to why these actions should be implemented because it directly speaks to the impact and the benefits that could be achieved from public health. Um, LEAP is a tool that continues to be developed. So just to finish my presentation, I'd like to highlight that um, currently we can look at health and air pollution and those co-benefits of climate and emission reduction um, actions. And we can look at those um, uh, disaggregated by gender, by age group, but we're continuing to develop LEAP to be able to look at a much broader set of development indicators um, to, that could be affected by particular mitigation measures. So for example, on, on human health, we're assessing or, or upgrading LEAP to be able to look at the impacts of different diets on um, health impacts from malnutrition or obesity or particular dietary risks and then how that links through to agricultural systems and their impacts on the environment and climate. In the transport sector, we're looking at the um, injuries and health impacts coming from traffic accidents, as well as the benefits of active travel, and are expanding um, across to other development indicators like biodiversity, um, um, deforestation, health benefits from water and sanitation, and macroeconomic indicators as well. So our intention is to make LEAP a tool, as Eric said, that can be used by a broad range of uh, uh, planners and decision makers, but that can be used to get an indication of a, a much broader set of impacts of implementing those policies and measures to try and facilitate um, decision making that is aware of the broad range of implications of those actions. And with that, I'll pass back to Dr. Kim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's really informative. Now, I would like to call on uh, Dr. the next speaker, Dr. Kendra Williams. So Kendra is a technical officer in the Air Quality and Health Unit of the World Health Organization, or WHO. She holds a PhD in International Health, Social, Behavioral Intervention from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. She has a background in research on adoption of clean cooking solution and is currently supporting development of the definition of clean household energy solution tunkis or good chest. Kendra will share about tools 
assessing the genders impacts of household air pollution and clean energy adoption within the context of the work of FNHO. I also like to inform you that in our section, Kendra is joined by her colleague, Dr. Karin Tronskuso, and another expert who can answer questions from our city participants. Dr. Kendra, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Kiman, for that introduction. Um, so today, let me just share this presentation. Um, I'll be talking to you today about some of the tools that are available within the WHO Clean Household Energy Solutions Toolkit. Um, and I've structured the presentation to focus on those tools that align with the theme of the day, which is the gendered impact of air pollution. Um, but I'll also be mentioning a couple of other tools that are available and provide the link to the entire toolkit if you're interested in in exploring some of those tools more. Um, so first, I just wanted to give a background on what is household air pollution. So currently one third, nearly 40% of the world's population still relies on polluting fuels and stoves for cooking. And polluting fuels include things like wood, dung, charcoal, and agriculture that are burned in traditional or open fire stoves, releasing lots of smoke that causes, that releases pollutants and causes lots of damage, not only to health, but to the environment and climate as well. So some of the specific health impacts of household air pollution are um, that household air pollution leads to diseases including stroke, ischemic heart disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, and pneumonia, um, le which leads and is associated with nearly 4 million premature deaths every year. There's also emerging evidence that household air pollution is linked to adverse, adverse pregnancy outcomes, poor cognitive development, diabetes, tuberculosis, and various cancers. And household air pollution disproportionately affects women and children because they are the ones who are typically responsible for performing the cooking and fuel collection tasks at the household level. So some studies in Africa and Asia have found that women can spend between three and nearly six hours cooking and collecting fuel per day, which deprives them of time that they could otherwise spend on income generation activities, education, um, or just rest and leisure. So this disproportionate effect on women is evident by the fact that household air pollution is the fifth leading risk factor for, for morbidity and mortality among women in low income countries, low and middle income countries, but it's eighth among men who are less commonly responsible for these tasks and less commonly face the associated exposures. And lastly, nearly 60% of premature deaths from MAP are in women and children. And again, there are also environmental impacts of household air pollution. It contributes to outdoor air pollution because things that are burned inside seep outside through the, the windows and doors and chimneys of households. So household air pollution is attributed to up to 50% of outdoor air pollution in some countries. And household air pollution also affects the climate. Nearly 50 50% of the global anthropogenic black carbon emissions are from household residential fuel use. And lastly, household air pollution contribute, well, not lastly, but lastly of what I will talk about here is that it contributes to deforestation and a, a decrease in biodiversity. So we have tools available that can help us evaluate the impact of household air pollution, as well as the impact of clean household energy solutions that are available to address household air pollution. So for example, adoption of clean um, household energy solutions that, that operate on clean fuels, such as electricity, liquefied petroleum gas, ethanol, natural gas, or solar energy. Um, these types of adoption of these types of, of technologies can help reduce household air pollution and we need to be able to understand what impact they're having or could have. 
So first, um, as I mentioned again, I'm, I'm focusing on tools that, that highlight the gender element of household air pollution and clean household energy impacts. So the first tool that I'll talk about here is the Global Health, WHO Global Health Observatory, which provides data on tracking two sustainable development goal indicators. So the first is the proportion of the population that primarily relies on clean and polluting, clean or polluting fuels for cooking. So you can look at either one. And the second is the, de the deaths attributed to ambient and household air pollution. And this indicator, you can actually look at the breakdown between how many deaths from household air pollution occur in males and how many occur in females. So you can see here this example from Ghana, the female death rate is actually higher, 109 per 100,000 population than the male death rate. Um, another tool that the WHO has, has developed in coordination with many partners is called the Core Questions on Household Energy Use. Now this tool is a set of questions that can be incorporated into national surveys to assess the household energy um, technologies, fuels and technologies that are used for cooking, heating and lighting and other related factors. Um, the set of questions contains a section on household energy and gender, which explores aspects related to how much time is spent cooking and who's responsible for this task, which can be linked back to, to gender, um, how much time is spent collecting fuel and also whether any injuries have been obtained while collecting fuel, um, which again is, can be linked back to, to the gender of the person responsible. Um, so these questions are currently being implemented in many countries. Many countries have decided to incorporate the questions or some of the questions into their um, national surveys. So for example, the demographic and health surveys or the multiple indicator cluster surveys, PHS and MIX, um, are some commonly implemented national surveys. And these questions come in various formats that can be easily integrated into those surveys so that countries can collect additional data on cooking, heating, and lighting to help monitor the, the state of household air pollution in their, their communities and the impacts that it's having on um, health and other factors, health and livelihoods. Um, so we also have a guidebook that accompanies the core questions, with guidance on how to administer them, and also how to calculate and analyze the data. So how to calculate key indicators resulting, um, using the data that results from administration of the core questions. Um, and it also includes a section for determining which indicators are relevant to gender, uh, and assessing the gendered impacts, as well as how to collect and, and analyze that data. So I added this in last minute, given the discussions that we've been hearing um, throughout this session and the interest in cost-benefit analyses. So this is a, a new tool that was just released in July of this year um, by the WHO that analyzes the costs and benefits specific to household energy policies. So the tool enables you to estimate what costs and benefits there are um, related to, to household energy policy options. So you can design a scenario in which different types of policies are implemented to encourage the population who is currently relying on polluting cooking, so the use of wood, charcoal, kerosene, coal, etc., to shift to cleaner options, as mentioned. Um, so this allows you to apply policies such as stoves, subsidies for stoves, which decrease the cost for purchasing clean fuel stoves, um, as well as um, technology bans, which prohibit the use of um, polluting technologies, for example, um, or fuel subsidies, which subsidize the continued costs of, of clean fuel refills. Um, as well as several other policy, possible policy interventions. Um, and then the tool allows you to plug in the transition that you're hoping to achieve. So for example, moving um, existing wood users to electricity 
and the type of policy that you're going to use to enable people to make that transition. And then it, it outputs the total costs of these policies to both governments as well as individuals, and as well as the potential benefits that it could occur as a result of that transition. And these include benefits to health, climate, as well as the environment. So um, how can you use BARHAP? You can use this tool to evaluate different clean cooking policy and technology combinations that your country may be considering implementing to achieve greater use of clean fuel technologies and to determine which of those might be the most cost effective based on the costs that will be required to implement the program as well as the benefits that could be achieved from the program. So using the results, countries can select and implement whichever strategy um, appears to best meet local needs and priorities in, in terms of the financial costs as well as the, the benefits that are anticipated for health, environment, and climate. So here's just a, um, some screenshots from the tool that show the different types of transitions that can be modeled from polluting, more polluting fuels uh, to cleaner fuels. So this includes transitions to improved biomass stoves, as well as to clean fuel stoves. And you can also model a transition from LPG um, with, to electricity, which is considered a, the, a cleaner form of clean fuel. Um, and on the right here, you can see the different types of, of policy scenarios that can be applied to support your, the transition that you're modeling. Um, so lastly, I'll just talk quickly about this last tool that is, um, well, another tool that's available in the WHO CHESS toolkit. The, it's called the Air Pollution Burden of Disease Explorer, which focuses on the health burden that could be avoided by implementing a household energy intervention that achieves a specific reduction in exposures. So the tool is really designed to focus on exposure reductions that you anticipate achieving and what health outcomes would result from achieving those exposure reductions. So again, all of these tools are available at the links um, I've included in each of the slides. So you're welcome to, we will share these slides with everyone after the session and you're welcome to click on the links to access the tools. All of the tools are free to access and use. Um, and free to write um, me or the household energy um, unit at um, WHO. So here are all of the, this is a slide just showing the test tool. It has six different modules, which all contain different tools um, for monitoring, evaluating, and implementing clean household energy solutions. Um, and you can access the toolkit and all of the tools at the link I've provided here. Um, now, I just wanted to say a few words about some additional equipment that is available for monitoring household air pollution and how it can be applied. Um, so first, there are household air pollution and exposure monitors available for bringing the kitchen level as well as personal exposures to household air, different household air pollutants. So I'm showing here three different monitors, the ECM, the LACAR, and the AeroQual, which can be used to assess exposure to fine particulate matter, PM2.5 carbon monoxide, and NO2. And um, these monitors can be worn by participants in order to assess their personal exposures or located in to assess the levels of, of household air pollutants that are being released by the technologies used in that household. And this is just a slide to show how these, these monitors were applied in a study that was conducted in Peru um, by a group at Johns Hopkins University. Um, you can see here in red the households in the control group who were continuously cooking with biomass stoves and in blue, the households that were cooking with biomass at baseline, but transitioned to using LPG stoves, liquefied petroleum gas stoves, um, over the course of a year. 
And you can see how the exposure levels that were, were recorded by these monitors, sorry, this is kitchen conditions that were recorded by these monitors, were much higher and, and stayed higher among the participants using biomass stoves and reduced among the participants who transitioned to LPG. So this is just one application of how these monitors can be used to assess the impacts of a clean household energy intervention. Um, and you can do the same for personal exposure. You see similar, similar trends here. And lastly, there are devices called stove use monitors, which measure the temperature of stoves. And these monitors can be used to determine when a stove is in use. When there's a temperature peak, it indicates that the stove is on. And when the temperature goes back down, it indicates that the stove has been turned off. So by monitoring these temperatures, you can tell whether a household is using an improved clean fuel stove or additional stove or an open fire. And you can monitor how much time is spent using both of those different types of stoves. Um, so with this data conducted analysis such as this one by the same uh, group at Johns Hopkins University, um, where you can see here that the control household in green who are using biomass stoves spent much more time, total time cooking households in the intervention group who were using liquefied petroleum gas stoves. So you can see that the, the clean fuel intervention that we implemented reduced the total amount of time that was spent cooking, which then has implications for freeing up time that could be spent on their activities. And this is especially relevant for women who are typically doing the cooking that indicates that they have more time to do other things besides cooking. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer any questions and also feel free to contact me at this email if you have questions about how to use any of these tools or how to access them. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. We have learned that there are a lot of tools, so we hope that we could also access the tools to use in the future. So now, uh, we have heard about the data and we have about the tools in informing air quality and climate intervention. It is now time to hear from our second set of panelists uh, on their own experience of using data and tools in policy and decision making and when at in implementing solution and any feedback they may help to our first set of speakers. Uh, with this, I would like to call on Ms. Sophie Lin Nawati and Mr. Liu Tentai, Ms. Sylvia Black. So I would like to start with Ms. Sophia Lin Nawati first. She is the head of the Regional Development Planning uh, under the Development of Planning Agency of the Regional Development Planning Agency of BAPEDA of Bogo City, Indonesia. May I ask you to address the following nine questions. First, how can the tools presented earlier by our speakers be useful for air quality and climate intervention that Bogo City is undertaking or planning to undertake? And the second question, is any feedback you would like to share with our speakers from SCE? and WHO in connection with your own experience of using tools and data. So, Ms. Sophia Lunawati, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kim. Are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, Please thank you. Okay, uh, okay, allow me to deliver my presentation uh, in Indonesian. Okay. Uh, terima kasih atas kesempatannya hari ini. Mohon maaf, saya mewakili Bapak Rudi Masudi uh, karena beliau hari ini uh, berhalangan hadir karena uh, sedang ada tugas lain yang uh, lebih pen, lebih uh, memerlukan kehadiran beliau. Bisa dimulai untuk presentasinya? Oke. Okay. 
uh, Bapak Ibu sekalian uh, hari ini kami uh, dari kota Bogor ingin sedikit berbagi terkait dengan uh, rencana kami terkait rencana pengembangan transportasi berkelanjutan Okay, can show the presenter? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Masukkan. Oke, itu tadi aku siapin. Oke, bentuknya PDF ya. Okay, do the technical problem. May I call on uh, Mr. Liu start first? So, uh, Mr. Liu Tan Tai from Kentho Environmental Protection Agency in Vietnam. So he's the deputy director of Environmental Protection Agency in Kentho University. He's responsible for the monitoring and management of environmental issues since February. Uh, he has a master in environmental science from Kanto University. He has worked for over 18 years with the Department of Natural Resources and Environment of Kanto City. And now he served uh, under a number of positions oh. as the Vice Director of Kanto Center uh, of Natural Resource and Environmental Monitoring and Deputy uh, Chief of the Climate Change Coordination Office. So he has participated and plays key roles in environment and climate change projects, partnering with international organizations such as GIZ, ICET, CTC, and Clean Air Asia. Uh, so I also asked uh, Mr. Tai to uh, follow the guide questions. So to respond to the following. The first question is, how can the tools presented earlier by our speakers be useful for air quality and climate intervention that Kanto City is undertaking or planning to undertake? The second question is, that, is there any data you would like to share with our speaker from SCA and WHO in connection with your own experience of using tools and data? So first, I would like to phone uh, Mr. Tai. So Mr. Tai, please. Yeah. Cảm ơn uh, tiến sĩ uh, Nguyễn Thị Kim Vân. Uh, kính thưa tiến sĩ uh, Nguyễn Thị Kim Vân, chủ uh, tọa phiên họp. Uh, kính thưa quý uh, vị đại biểu, uh, thì lời đầu tiên uh, xin uh, cho tôi được gửi lời uh, đến uh, ban tổ chức, toàn thể uh, quý đại biểu, lời chúc sức khỏe và lời chào trân trọng nhất. Thì tôi cũng uh, chân thành cảm ơn uh, ban tổ chức cụ thể là tổ chức không khí sạch châu Á, viện uh, môi trường chiến lược toàn cầu, viện công nghệ châu Á, viện môi trường thị điển đã gửi thư mời và cho phép tôi được uh, bài ý kiến tại cái phiên hội thảo này. thì uh, sau khi nghe cái phần báo cáo của các diễn giả, 
thì tôi cũng rất là cảm ơn cái bài báo cáo của tiến sĩ Trúc Nelly ở viện môi trường thụy điển tiến sĩ Kenda Vida của tổ chức y tế thế giới thì tôi đánh giá rất là cao cái vai trò của dữ liệu cũng như là những cái công cụ trong cái việc hỗ trợ cho cơ quan quản lý nhà nước và chính quyền để ra quyết định và ban hành các chính sách về giảm thiểu ô nhiễm không khí và thích ứng với cái biến đổi khí hậu cụ thể là cái công cụ clip IPC là một trong những cái công cụ tích hợp rất là tốt để đánh giá tổng thể ít của sự thay đổi năng lượng sử dụng đến giảm khí thải nhà kính và ô nhiễm không khí đối với cái công cụ À mà do cái tổ chức y tế thế giới trình bày thì đây là một trong những cái công cụ cũng rất là hữu ích cho cái, những cái nghiên cứu ô nhiễm không khí trong nhà. thì từ các nghiên cứu của các diễn giả báo cáo nêu trên thì tôi nhận thấy cùng với cái quy mô và cái định hướng phát triển của thành phố Cần Thơ hiện nay của chúng tôi thì những cái công cụ này rất là hữu ích cho chính quyền thành phố nhằm hỗ trợ tốt cho việc ra quyết định cũng như là ban hành các chính sách để thực hiện những cái kế hoạch hành động không khí sạch và những cái kế hoạch thích ứng với biến đổi khí hậu của thành phố trong thời gian tới thì cũng tại cái phiên à, hội thảo này thì tôi cũng mong muốn được các diễn giả chia sẻ thêm một cái thông tin cụ thể thì đối với cái công cụ lip IPC thì tôi nghĩ rằng việc thu thập những cái thông tin dữ liệu đầu vào cho cái công cụ này thì rất là rộng chi tiết cũng như là cần những cái chuyên môn rất là sâu của các chuyên gia hay là các nhà khoa học do đó thì theo à, suy nghĩ của tôi đối với những cái nước những cái thành phố đang phát triển thì cái nguồn thông tin dữ liệu đầu vào thì ít hoặc là thiếu những cái nguồn thải thì rất là nhiều nhưng mà cũng chưa có những cái việc khảo sát kiểm đếm cụ thể thì Thế thì việc giải quyết thách thức về số liệu đó thì phía của tiến sĩ Sip Mali đã thực hiện như thế nào? Ý thứ hai là Việt Nam và thành phố Cần Thơ của chúng tôi thì cũng chưa có những cái tiêu chuẩn về chất lượng không khí trong nhà. Thành phố của chúng tôi cũng còn rất là nhiều gia đình sử dụng than củi để nấu ăn và sinh hoạt trong gia đình. Thì do đó cái bếp sử dụng nhiên liệu sạch thì rất là cần thiết nhưng nhận thức và kinh phí cũng là gào cản của người dân khi mà phải thay đổi sử dụng những cái nhiên liệu sạch hay là sử dụng những cái bếp sạch khác thì do đó theo cái kinh nghiệm của tổ chức y tế thế giới thì để giải quyết vấn đề này ở các nước phát triển thì thực hiện như thế nào thì ngoài ra tại phiên hội thảo này tôi cũng xin phép được chia sẻ thêm một số thông tin về thành phố của chúng tôi thì thành phố Cần Thơ là một trong những thành phố lớn của Việt Nam có vị trí là trung tâm của đồng bằng sông Cửu Long, thuận lợi về giao thông, thương mại và là động lực phát triển của cả vùng đồng bằng. Thì tuy nhiên trong quá trình phát triển kinh tế xã hội hiện nay thì thành phố cũng phải đối mặt với những cái thách thức của quá trình đô thị hóa, ô nhiễm không khí, ô nhiễm môi trường và những năm gần đây là cái hiện tượng thời tiết cực đoan ảnh hưởng của biến đổi khí hậu toàn cầu. Thì trước cái thực trạng trên thì để tăng cường cái khả năng thích ứng, thúc đẩy phát triển đô thị theo hướng xanh bằng dẫn thì chính quyền thành phố cũng đang thực hiện đồng bộ các giải pháp những cái dự án công trình và phi công trình cũng như là xây dựng và triển khai các kế hoạch hành động về chất lượng không khí rồi kế hoạch hành động thích ứng với biến đổi khí hậu rồi kế hoạch thực hiện cái thỏa thuận Paris về giảm khí thải nhà kính thì tuy nhiên trong quá trình triển khai những cái nội dung điều trên thì chúng tôi cũng gặp rất là nhiều khó khăn thách thức là do hạn chế về cái nguồn tài chính, nguồn lực cũng như là nhận thức và sự tham gia của cộng đồng địa phương. Đặc biệt là về nguồn thông tin, cơ sở dữ liệu đầu vào cũng như là các công cụ kỹ thuật thì cũng chưa được tích hợp để giúp kiểm soát ô nhiễm, giảm phát thải và lập bản đồ dự báo chất lượng môi trường thích ứng với biến đổi khí hậu nhằm hỗ trợ tốt cho cái công tác quản lý nhà nước về mặt môi trường thích ứng biến đổi khí hậu cũng như là ban hành những cái chính sách những cái quyết định kịp thời ở cấp thành phố thì chính quyền thành phố của chúng tôi thì cũng rất là quan tâm tạo điều kiện và mong nhận được cái sự tài trợ hỗ trợ hợp tác quốc tế của các tổ chức quốc tế cũng như là các đối tác quốc tế để giúp cho chúng tôi giải quyết những cái vấn đề về môi trường thích ứng biến đổi khí hậu trong xây dựng và phát triển thành phố thì bản thân tôi thì cũng rất là mong muốn nhận được sự chia sẻ 
hỗ trợ kỹ thuật để tăng cường năng lực tiếp cận với các công cụ tích hợp hữu ích để giúp cho cái công tác chuyên môn cũng như là tham mưu tốt cho lãnh đạo của thành phố ra quyết định kịp thời chính xác và ban hành các chính sách nhiều quá cho thành phố thì tôi xin kết thúc cái bài phát biểu tại đây thì cuối cùng tôi xin chúc quý vị dồi dào sức khỏe hạnh phúc thành đạt xin chân thành cảm ơn quý vị đã lắng nghe Okay, thank you. There are some technical problem. Thank you, Mr. Tai. It's really a very nice uh, reflection from you. And and I believe that and I believe that there yeah, also you have uh, thrown out some questions. So yes. So uh, uh, then the, the speakers. On uh, uh, Kendra, Dr. Kendra would respond to your question on the uh, issue related to household uh, air pollution, indoor air quality standards, and also how to use the tools in Vietnam. So, thank you very much. So, next, uh, I wonder if Miss Sophia is ready. Miss Sophia? Is Miss Sophie ready? Yes. So, sudah, Bu. Sudah, sudah. Sudah, Sophia okay. sudah siap. Thank you. Please, follow is yours. Oke, okay, terima kasih uh, atas kesempatannya. Uh, mohon maaf, tadi ada kesalahan teknis. Bapak Ibu sekalian kami dari kota Bogor ingin menyampaikan terkait dengan uh, rencana pengembangan transportasi yang berkelanjutan di kota Bogor Oke lanjut ya, Kota Bogor memiliki memiliki uh, luasan yang relatif sangat kecil yaitu seluas 11.000 11.138 hektar dengan uh, terdiri dari 6 kecamatan dan uh, 68 kelurahan dengan jumlah penduduk sekitar 1 juta jiwa itu berdasarkan hasil uh, badan statistik nasional ya, yang ada di tahun 2021 kota Bogor di dalam rencana pembangunan jangka menengah daerah tahun 2002, 2019 sampai 2024 eh, memiliki visi yaitu eh, Bogor yang ramah keluarga dan juga mempunyai misi terkait dengan kota sehat, kota cerdas dan eh, kota sejahtera. Di dalam identitasnya kota Bogor menetapkan tiga identitas yaitu eh, identitas yaitu Heritage City, Green City, dan Smart City. Oke, okay, lanjut. Nah, di dalam uh, rencana pembangunan kota Bogor di tahun 2019 sampai 2024, kita mempunyai uh, per program uh, pembangunan prioritas dan strategi, yaitu yang pertama adalah peningkatan uh, kualitas hidup masyarakat, yang kedua adalah e, pembangunan infrastruktur dan pemulihan ekonomi berbasis potensi lokal dan yang ketiga adalah reformasi birokrasi. Nah di dalam program-program e, tersebut kita e, ada beberapa janji politik yang yang disampaikan oleh e, Bapak Wali Kota kami yaitu terkait dengan Bogor Lancar, Bogor Merenah, Bogor Kasohor. Bogor Motekar, Bogor Samawa dan Abdi Bogor Nah di dalam uh, hubungannya dengan 
pengembangan transportasi berkelanjutan ini kita kota Bogor melakukan satu program yang namanya adalah Bogor Lancar di mana Bogor Lancar ini beberapa hal beberapa program yang kita rencanakan yaitu terkait rerouting dan shifting angkutan transportasi mas publik lalu pembangunan jalan-jalan alternatif, lalu pembangunan flyover di beberapa titik, lalu ada juga revitalisasi uh, beberapa stasiun uh, di kota Bogor, lalu pembangunan park and ride, serta ada juga pembangunan atau revitalisasi dari beberapa terminal yang ada di kota Bogor. Nah, lanjut. Untuk eh, kenapa kita memili, eh, mem, merencanakan suatu eh, pengembangan transportasi berkelanjutan ini karena memang di dalam kota Bogor ini arah pergerakan penumpang di kota Bogor ini eh, cukup tinggi karena lebih dari 1,2 juta perjalanan dengan eh, jarak eh, dengan sekitar 600 ribu manusia yang ada di kota Bogor ini melakukan pergerakan dari Bogor, Jakarta dan kembali lagi ke Bogor setiap hari karena kota Bogor merupakan e, kota penyangga dari ibu kota sehingga memang banyak masyarakat yang e, kot, masyarakat kota Bogor bekerja di ibu kota dan juga adanya perbandingan penggunaan transportasi e, pribadi dengan transportasi umum itu masih tinggi 77 persen masyarakat di kota Bogor ini masih menggunakan kendaraan pribadi dibandingkan menggunakan kendaraan umum lalu luak panjang dari jalan yang ada di kota Bogor ini ini eh, tidak eh, relatif pendek yaitu se, hanya seluas sepanjang 2.320,02 km dengan total jalan arteri dan kolektor itu sepanjang 713,63 km dan juga kondisi uh, dalam kondisi uh, jalannya berkondisi baik itu se sebesar 88,59 uh, persen. Oke, okay, uh, lanjut. Nah, uh, di dalam transportasi ini memang untuk emisi ini sangat ber, uh, berpengaruh uh, terhadap emisi yang ada di Kota Bogor. Di di dalam uh, penggunaan bahan bakar di Kota Bogor ini masih uh, didominasi oleh penggunaan bahan bakar minyak. Sehingga uh, itu sekitar uh, penggunaannya di 200 eh 2 juta ya 2 juta 688 68 ton e, ribu ton yang masih meng, e, kota Bogor masih menggunakan bahan bakar e, minyak yang digunakan oleh karena itu e, ini sangat berpengaruh terhadap e, tingkat emisi yang ada di kota Bogor sehingga kami e, di pemerintah daerah sudah mencoba uh, membuat satu inovasi dan rencana pengembangan uh, tran, uh, di bidang transportasi ini dalam rangka menurunkan uh, emisi uh, yang ada di kota Bogor. Adapun beberapa uh, inovasi yang kita atau uh, jenis transportasi yang akan kita kembangkan tentu saja adalah transportasi massal percepatan untuk transportasi umum masal ini kita uh, coba dengan satu uh, transformasi transformasi transportasi umum masal berbasis rel dan juga berbasis jalan untuk berbasis rel kami saat ini me sedang mengembangkan uh, jenis transportasi tram yang saat ini posisi sedang uh, baru kita menyelesaikan visibility studinya dan yang kedepannya akan kita kembangkan menjadi 
uh, transportasi massal. Lalu yang kedua juga uh, ada rencana dari proyek strategis nasional yaitu terkait dengan pembangunan LRT Jabodetabek yang rencananya akan uh, dari C yang saat ini posisi masih sampai Cibubur uh, Jakarta akan di dilanjutkan ke Bogor. Lalu dengan adanya LRT ini tentu saja kita juga uh, merencanakan satu loop line LRT Kota Bogor dan juga adanya uh, saat ini posisi sedang pembangunan double track Bogor Sukabumi. Nah untuk uh, transportasi massal berbasis jalan ini kita juga sedang mengembangkan uh, BRT internal antar kota Bogor juga BRT yang dari kota Bogor menuju Kabupaten Bogor, lalu BRT untuk kota Bogor ke Jadetabek, dan juga pengembangan angkutan penumpang atau feeder uh, antara uh, antar BRT yang ada di kota Bogor yang menuju ke Jakarta. Nah, untuk sisi transportasi ini, next, ini please. next please, oke. Okay. Next slide, oke. Okay, uh, next, oke. Okay. Ini adalah be beberapa contoh, uh, contoh peng pengembangan transportasi yang ada di Kota Bogor. Ini ada uh, kita juga mencoba sudah mem merencanakan beberapa uh, lokasi transit oriented development atau TOD untuk yang menghubungkan uh, beberapa titik kumpul dari uh, transportasi yang ada di kota Bogor. Nah, dari uh, untuk transportasi ini, inilah yang akan menghubungkan uh, antar, antar TOD dari kota Bogor. Seperti contoh untuk tram, tram ini juga nanti akan menghubungkan uh, antara TOD Baranang Siang ke TOD Stasiun Bogor. Dan juga... Uh, di sini juga kita akan melakukan beberapa pembangunan infrastruktur terkait eh, penunjang untuk transportasi, transportasi eh, masal tersebut. Lalu juga kita sudah juga melakukan pembangunan beberapa pedestrian yang ada di kota Bogor ini dan sampai saat ini sampai tahun 2023 kami juga sudah merencanakan beberapa eh, lokasi pedestrian yang akan dibangun. Uh, juga kita sudah merencanakan beberapa area parkir uh, di sekitaran uh, titik transportasi yang ada di kota Bogor baik di stasiun maupun di uh, terminal. Uh, kita juga sudah saat ini mempunyai BRT, saat ini juga kami uh, sedang uh, menjalankan program dari Kementerian Perhubungan yaitu uh, pelayanan bis melalui program by the service ini merupakan bentuk layanan pemerintah kepada masyarakat di bidang transportasi juga kita sudah mengembangkan eh, penggunaan kendaraan berbahan bakar gas ini juga kita lakukan ini kita pernah melakukan juga mengkonversi eh, angkutan umum dari dari angkutan berbahan bakar minyak menjadi berbahan bakar gas dan juga kita sudah memiliki beberapa bis sekolah untuk mengakomodir eh, anak mengantar jemput anak-anak sekolah anak-anak berangkat ke sekolah sehingga mengurangi penggunaan kendaraan pribadi eh, mungkin itu yang dapat kami sampaikan terkait dengan program-program eh, pengembangan transportasi yang ada di kota Bogor terima kasih dokter Krim Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Sophie. Thank you. So, uh, we hear about the challenge and the, the activity that Bobo City is uh, undertaking. And thank you for sharing that. Then now I would like to call uh, our uh, last speaker. So, so, now we would like to hear from Miss Sylvia Mikla who is the Executive Director of the Environmental Science for Social Change, OESC. 
a Jesus Research and Training Institute. So she leads the work in sustainability and social justice through the integration of scientific methodology and social processes, promotes environmental sustainability and social justice through integrating scientific methodology and the process social processes. ESC engage with community, local governments, the government line agency at the local and national level in uh, with the other stakeholders and also networks across the Asian Pacific region in moving an agenda of science for the sustainability. ESSC uh, research agenda integrates the impact of the changing climate and policy reviews in its various work programs. So, Ms. McLeod, may I ask you to respond to the following questions? Could you please share ESSC experience in using data and tools to promote inclusion? of communities in environmental interventions and when it facilitated dialogue with policies and decision makers. The second question is that, is there any feedback you would like to share with our speaker from SCE and WHO in connection with your own experience of using tools and data? So, Ms. Mikla, thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, can you hear me clearly? We can. We cannot yes? hear you. Okay. You cannot. Can you hear me? Yes. Dr. Kim. Please go ahead. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this invitation to join and share in this event. I'm from the Philippines, and I appreciate the presentations in this session. If you don't mind, Mr. K uh, Dr. Kim, I will respond to the second question first. Um, the presentations are very useful in improving air quality monitoring, and I'm sure these are well received by those who are working in the air quality monitoring sector. Local data will definitely be enhanced by these contemporary tools and can help in better decision making by city governments and urban planners. The air quality in Metro Manila and other major cities in the Philippines is considered heavily polluted and are cleared when major typhoons with great winds sweep away the polluted air. So. Um, the reason I do that, and now I go to, my, to the second question, is that our group, as I previously clarified with the organizers, uh, we do not directly work with clean air efforts. And we work in the rural and urban context, rural-urban. But I think, uh, given the presentations, there are a lot of meeting points on the ground when we are faced with people and communities who bear the impacts of a degraded environment and a changing climate. And we are all experimenting and exploring tools and methods, dialogue strategies for a common purpose, which is change, as the present context is untenable. I resonate with Dr. Zussman's remark in the initial part of the session on the need for a science policy society interface, interface in our frameworks, in our programs. So just to give a very brief um, discussion, ESSC is focused more on the land and the resources, and we work with communities and local governments who are using, managing, and planning the land and its resources, and also understanding the drivers of the changes that are happening in land use. So our work programs include forest cover analysis, land cover assessment, watershed and land use management, disaster risk and vulnerability reduction, and working with indigenous communities in ancestral domain management. So we also accompany that with uh, training efforts. So these are where the data and the tools um, and methods come in as we 
proceed with forest and water resource management and training for local governments and communities. Um, there is geomatics training for local government planning using uh, open source, QGIS, basic and advanced. So apart from the youth programs that we also um, do in the uplands. But I think I will uh, share more in terms of three points that relate with this topic. Obviously, climate change affects all of this in different ways. And the effort is to integrate climate change in the policy reforms and in the actions that need to be taken. So uh, I will relate now with this topic and how we use data, tools, and methods in promoting active participation of stakeholders in our work programs. So first point. Inclusion and active participation of communities and stakeholders are inherent in the methods and strategies. So at the very start, so our interventions are stemming from concerns and challenges experienced either by communities or local governments or other sectors who share this with us. So at the onset, at the beginning, with the identification of the concern, whether it's the scarcity of water resources, or there's a problem in forest management, disaster risk production planning. Partners are part of the effort at the very beginning because they know what the problem is. So this ensures greater stakeholdership, and especially for local governments, a serious commitment in terms of financial and human resource allocation, as well as infrastructure reform, as the case may be. Second point, Community knowledge and practices help validate greatly the technical information generated. Our geomatics unit that does the forest uh, cover, uh, forest uh, and land cover assessment uses remote sensing analysis in understanding the changes in land use. And we also challenge land and forest classifications by government and also by FAO. So this enhancement and challenging of technical information are greatly enhanced by community local knowledge on the ground, such as the types of forests, how they are culturally valued and protected, the rivers and streams, the mountains and peaks, the biodiversity in these areas. So from where we started in the early 1990s in community resource mapping and the integration of these community maps with technical maps, information generated is richer and reality-based. There are also tools for DRR planning and obtaining community information for integration to enhance geohazard maps. Third point, and this is the last, decision-making is thus more realistic, more grounded, and the information such as those maps integrated with community knowledge are transformed into dialogue and scenario building tools for changes in government policy or project implementation. They also become inputs to regional and global discussions, such as, such as the COP process, the climate change talks, the UN Indigenous Fora, the SDG and Agenda 2030, even the Agroecology and Food System Summits, where we also engage. So ESSC has this multi-stakeholder dialogue facility, which we call the Philippine Working Group. It's an informal gathering of government, practitioners, professionals, media, academe, development agencies, local governments, and community representatives. It's a sort of hats-off roundtable discussion among colleagues, often friends, but who share the same values and concerns that changes are needed and they are willing to explore the change in whatever capacity they hold. In this gathering is where the data, the information, the analysis and recommendations for action are discussed, as well as the ways forward. And if government also cannot move, so we understand that. Topics that have been discussed include community forest management, biodiversity, DRR, so, and these are usually preceded by community visits. Uh, to enable the participants to engage directly with communities and local governments. So, sorry, these are more the, um, I think, the meeting points with um, how the tools that were shared here today, as we are all looking for sustainable and inclusive solutions, no? Um, we might not be doing air quality efforts, but I appreciate the, the invitation from the organizers to be able to share what ESSC is doing. So I hope these are useful. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Miss uh, Miss Clark. Of course, your sharing our social experience is very important for us in this workshop too. So now with that, I would like to uh, share one of my slides. Let me see if I can share it. Can you see my slide? Not. Okay. Okay. So this, what I would like here to first thanks all the speaker and panelists uh, for providing uh, the information and also the the experience of using the tool and using the data enlighten us with the importance of uh, role of the data in the decision making. So here we can see the flow of the data actually. From this workshop, we can hear the data that we can get it from the monitoring, whether it by reference equipment, local sensor or local NAS, we call it, satellite data, other data tools, and we have emission in RAM data. We can put it dispersion model to generate air quality data in the domain. And from that data, the ambient level of the pollution, we talk about the effects, effect on human health, on crop ins, economy, and climate. So with that, from that data, we actually extract information and that information for decision making, whether it to change their behavior, like citizen to change the type of fuel and cook stop or to stop their uh, corn briquet um, use for cooking or for the policy makers to make the decision. So we are now entering in the big data era and evolution data actually, we also generate a lot forming big data and it is very important for us to make sure that the data actually um, are required quality, good quality in order to use for the purpose. It may, talking about the meeting data quality objectives. So now that data also need to be timely shared to users because if we don't share data so that data would not be useful because after a while, the data would not be that of that value anymore because we want to have a timely action to change the behavior or to, to influence the policy. So we understand the role of the data and IDC and chairs and various Household air pollution tools would be very useful for us uh, in managing our air quality, whether it's indoor, outdoor, because of we are exposed to indoor. The air pollution emitted indoor, eventually it also gets outdoor, the pollute ambient air. So with that, I would like to conclude this session and I thank all of speakers again and thank all of you for your active participation in the session and for all that questions, uh, we believe that the, the panelists will be able to address it or to put it in the chat box to answer it to you. So thank you very much. So.